one of Britain's finest photographers. Paul Joyce is celebrated for landscape and portrait work spanning five decades. He's been privileged to meet and befriend some of the great figures of 20th and 21st century culture, resulting in a remarkable body of work. Life Behind the Lens is a selection of his best images using the finest printers available. 40 years ago, the distinguished Colin Ford commissioned Paul to do a major exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery in London. It was called Elders and it became a photography landmark. Now, Colin has returned to curate life behind the lens. But what has changed over all these years? And how does a photographer reach behind the surface to capture the essence of people and places he sees? Colin Ford tries to uncover some of these secrets. What I, interests me in a way is what has changed for you since then? I mean, what I did when I saw your pictures in 77, I thought these are really good portraits of some very distinguished people. I may even be at some of the prints hanging on the wall out there. I see that I quoted here Bill Brandt, Max Wall, Nicholas Pevsner, Ralph Richardson. They're all out there at the moment. What has changed since The then? question was what has changed. The, uh, the subjects have become, become younger. And the photographers come out, yes. And the That's right. Okay. There's a greater difference. So Quentin Tarantino, for example, who I got to know as a, I wouldn't say as an intimate friend, but just as a friend. Uh, I met before anybody knew the name of Tarantino. And how did that happen? It happened through my, what skills I have as a documentary filmmaker, because I was asked by Channel 4, who had seen Reservoir Dogs, his first film, mm -hmm. um, to go out to California and, uh, and track him down because I was then doing a, a film which was an examination of independent cinema in the 80s and 90s. Most of the pictures out there surely yes. have nothing to do with money. You didn't take them to earn money or did you? No, I, uh, I, I wasn't paid. I was explaining a little earlier that um, my two attempts through Vogue to shoot pictures both failed. One of VX Pritchett because I was unwell and wasn't able to make the appointment. And the other, Ruth Prado Jabala, whose um, portrait was so shockingly bad that neither she, I, nor Condé Nast wanted to publish it. You accepted that it was extraordinarily bad? Yes. What was wrong with it? It wasn't a face that I chose to photograph. It was a face I was asked to photograph. Ah. That's the difference. So th you would find it difficult to take a really fine portrait of someone whose face you didn't particularly like? Or David like. Hockney has only accepted one commission and he's painted 5,000 portraits. Absolutely. One commission. And I agree with him. You, you paint what you love, you paint what you want, you paint who you know, you paint who you hate. Perfect. I, when I photographed Dirk Bogart, I could have killed him, and he could have killed me. Because? He hated to be photographed. But he's a very, he was a very photogenic man. Yes. And earned his living by being in front of a lens. But this was towards the end of his life when he'd basically given up. Okay. And he didn't want, he knew somehow that I would get something of him that he didn't want to be gone. And as William Boyd said, he was a man who wore all these masks and never, he never told the truth. He told half the truth, quarter of the truth. He was a great actor, but that side of him was highly dubious and I ca caught him. Don't you think that a very considerable majority of people who are in the exhibition, mm -hmm. famous people, wear masks, they yeah. put on Yes. Some sort of character or some... Uh, maybe we all do. It's not just the famous, it's all of us. Every day. And are you telling me then that the secret of taking a really good portrait is to get under, behind that mask? Yes. And how do you do it? It's a combination of things. There's no magic bullet or formula. Uh, the, the, the advantage I had when I came to you and started the Elders Project 
was that I'd always been interested in art. I thought that art could change me, make me a better person. And I still think that. I came to those people pre-planned. I, if, I, if I managed to photograph Benjamin Britten, who'd agreed to be photographed but died, I would have known something because I knew his music. I'd make sure that all those people, I wouldn't just go in, well, I've done a great deal of homework. I'd, I could quote Jean Rees back passages from Why Sargasso Sea when I met her. You know, I, a, a lot of those people who are dealing with photographers and media people, you know, they just, they come in with a set of questions or to take a photograph, they don't know who they're dealing with. I would never do that. I would, I would, well, as I said, all the people that I photographed were my choices, not somebody else's. And did you, during the session, talk to them about their work? Absolutely, absolutely. For example, uh, William Golding, who at that point, uh, since has been tarnished, you know, badly with the brush of uh, potential paedophilia, was, uh, th that wasn't an issue at all. We were just talking about his, his enormous ability. And I, I, I charmed him, I think, because, and I, I really believed what I was saying. He said that he'd always wanted to be a poet, not a writer, not a novelist. That he, and I think he published a slim volume of poems at the very uh, opening of his career. Probably be worth, you know, fortune now. And I said, um, William, your prose is poetry. <laughs> and I read a passage back to him um, from one of the books, and he, he, tears almost came into his eyes. Mm. Uh, and he said, you're very articulate. I said, I'm not as articulate as you are, sir. So there was a kind of, and then that allowed me, plus with the camera, which he was absolutely fascinated by, I could then take that picture of him with every hair in place. Now you've mentioned the camera. Tell us something about it, because it's not, I can list a dozen, 20, 30 famous photographers I've known I know no one else who uses a camera like yours. Tell me about it and tell me why. Manufactured by the Gandolfi brothers. Uh, mahogany and brass, traditional cameras in the um, late 1800s. Gandolfi brothers, I, I was um, born here in Hampshire and I was brought up in South London, Sydenham, Crystal Palace. And Penge is not far away, and that's where the Gandolfi brothers had their studio. To gosh, <laughs> so uh, and they were on the phone. And at that point, I realised that uh, the Gandolfi camera was a, even then a kind of trip, unusual item. So and Fred Gandolfi, they were wonderful. Albert, they were cockneys, you know, uh, who had inherited this business. And they were in their 70s, you know, and so it was towards the end of their career. You know, you're right. So I went round to photograph him, and at that point I, 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 I had a plate camera, but it wasn't a Gandolfi. And he agreed reluctantly to be photographed, so I, I got the camera and said, no, 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 said, that's no good. I said, no, no, I won't be taking on anything but a Gandolfi. So for an hour and a half, we had to fiddle with my lens piece and thing, and he had to fit one of his Gandolfis up with my lens so that I could take the photograph of him, which is in that show, on a Gandolfi. And of course, once I'd done it, I ordered two. And then I got the third, which is the one that's on display, which is cherry wood, which is only, and they only ever made six, 10 by eight, and it's never been used. The one in the, in the, in the case has never had well, no. we should have written that on the caption. This one is just for show. Well, it's not. It's going to be used, but it, it hasn't been yet. How do you... It, it is an extraordinary contrast. The sort of camera that you're describing and the whole business of setting it up and dealing with all that, with what everyone in this room has a camera in their hip pocket or whatever. Yes. Uh, we are told 
that four billion photographs are taken every day. Can one use a camera like that and still make great pictures? No. Uh, um, well, uh, probably out of the four billion, there's, there's one great picture which is undoubtedly, ac ones, isn't it? It's undoubtedly accidental and they won't recognise it as being great. <clears throat> so I was saying to Derek earlier, you know, the, my definition of, of, or when asked, is photography and art, I say when an artist wheels the camera. It's, it's, it's that perfectly fair. But yeah. it's, it's that simple. It seems to me that there is a little panel of pictures in that exhibition of 12 pictures that could, that almost look as if they've been taken by a mobile phone. And these are David Hockney in his swimming pool. Ah oh, yes. Uh, Is well, that possible or am no, I misreading, no, well, it was well, misreading them totally? It was well before. No, I understand that you didn't take them with that, but why are they different? Oh, they're different because they had to be taken over a very concentrated period and they involved an exercise, which was swimming the length and breadth of the pool. The idea being that I, I wanted, uh, in photographic terms, to try and represent the extraordinary distortions that he managed to achieve through his paintings of the pools. Mm -hmm. Well, people say, well, why didn't you do it in colour? Because he did it in colour. I was trying to, I was looking for something different, a, a, a different way of looking, but something that would align with, with his view and his obsession and interest with pools in my own way, pointing to what he perhaps had seen by showing him in, within that context. And they, they were shot in the in a period of about 10 minutes. So, uh, yes, there was a mobility and I was in the pool. It was a 35 millimeter camera, just an ordinary camera with black and white uh, negative. And so they've got, a, a, maybe what you're talking about is a sort of immediacy rather than a formal, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my other portraits of him are, are formal, formalized and would have involved setting the camera up, setting, getting him talking, exchanging, waiting. This was just on the fly. 90-something percent of the show, as you've mentioned it, are black and white photographs. Hmm. Why do you prefer black and white to colour? It's a, that's a, 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 a very interesting question and, and one that d does crop up. Um, and there are a number of uh, explanations why black and white catches the eye more. And um, it's not just that. I've always thought that um, in the way that if you want to photograph trees, the best time of year is when the leaves have fallen. So late autumn through the winter into early spring. The analogy with black and white is that what you get is that sort of effect when you photograph a face in black and white, it's as if winter has come into the mm. e equation. And what you're seeing the, is what's underneath the flesh. Getting behind the mask again. Exactly. And black and white can do that, and it can do it in the landscape too. And, I th and a lot of people think that my landscape work is as good, if not better, than the portraits. And I think the, uh, there's, a, there's a great connection between the two. I think the, the erosion and changing of time and the seasons on the landscape and on the face is more or less equivalent. Now, in this morning's Guardian, mm -hmm. you nominate this photograph of three great photographers, as it happens, as your best photograph. I've known it for years because very generously you gave me print of it a long time ago and it's hung in our house ever since. Um, why have you given it such a high rating? Well, I have to correct you. And this no, will, never. And this will mean that I'll never be published in The Guardian ever again. I sent them a dozen pictures and they chose that one. What good taste they have. Indeed. But the reason that that picture has become 
well known is simply that those three photographers, the three of the greatest photographers that we've ever, that, well, I've ever encountered, and certainly they never sat down all three together. That was the one and only time that all three of them, they knew each other individually, but they never sat down, the three of them together. I still want to know why, however famous the photographers are, <coughs> and however important an occasion it was that they met for the first time, why is it a great photograph? Oh, you'd have to answer that. I don't. Uh, I, I think it's. I think it's a, a, a rather um, upmarket snap, frankly. <laughs> so I, mean, I just got lucky. Uh, you know, I, I got lucky. Uh, I, I had the equipment, the Gandolfi and so yeah. on, so that they were all absolutely focused on that. And that would help photographers, wouldn't it? They'd oh, they loved it. Camera oh, they it. loved it. Yeah, I was immediately embraced. It was fine, and they just. Then they were relaxed, then they were relaxed. So there were certain things. I mean, I'm making light of it, yes. It was, it was a lucky snap, but very, very well organised. Which is sometimes, you get lucky, you know. Mm. I suppose. Who are the photographers who have most influenced you, have most affected your type of photography? Well, um, actually, and you're the great expert, Julia Margaret Cameron, because she did basically what I do, which is to get an old plate camera, and sometimes it's a little bit out of focus, but who gives a shit? Uh, and she wanted to meet the great and the good. You know, her relationships, as you know better than anyone, were with science, you know, philosophers, scientists, and so on. She was fascinating, and she was a great uh, photographer of children as well. You know, her subject matter was, was broad, and she was, and she, it was essential, the essentials. Piece of film, a bit of light, subject matter, and magic. You're the opposite of another great photographer I admired and I've commissioned and worked with, Arnold Newman. Yes. Who tried in every photograph to show what the person would do for a living. Hmm. And you don't do that very often. All right, you have Henry Moore sitting in front of a wonderful sculpture and so on. But most of the time, it's the face. Well, I think the face tells a story, you know, whether they're an accountant, or, which is un would be unusual for me to photograph, or an author. August Sander was the great, greatest example of that. Because, of course, he did a whole series of German workers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that would be my influence. And, and the, the pastry chef, for me is one of the great photographs of all time. Because that is the man in his environment proudly <laughs> demonstrating his skill or his, uh, his uh, calling. Yet it's a great, great portrait. So the, the, occasionally you can do that. I mean, I photographed Fred Gandolfi making a camera. Um, this was the poor curator's task, but of course for every picture that is in a show, there's a dozen or twenty or more that we couldn't include. One had to make a choice all the time, and I hope you respect the choice. You certainly seem to be oh, fairly encouraging. Of it, you know, we, there's no way we can show everything. No. Um, well, it, it'd be wonderful if you. I mean, I wouldn't want any other curator. You, you know, you, you were you were chosen for a very good reason. But actually, you could send in half a dozen curators to my archive and they come up with different totally shows. different, of course. And uh, that's rather thrilling. It won't happen, but, you know, uh, there it is. I think the question for, you know, quite a lot of people approaching my age is, what do you do with your archive? You know, do you, do you slim it down and say, well, out of 5,000 pictures, you know, there are 100 which, are, which make the grade and we just get rid of the rest. But the rest are quite interesting for other reasons. You know, when I was shooting the Elders show, um, I would take probably um, four dark slides, which would have um, a sheet of film either side. So eight. So the maximum I would shoot on with those people, like Henry Moore or AJ Air or Gombrick or whoever it was, would be eight. And then we'd sit down and choose one or two, all those negatives are in a box, okay. quite, quite safe. 
And uh, I've got the ones from the show, which are that thick, and I've got ones, from, you know, which were yes. Okay. And they're interesting because, uh, or interesting for someone else to look at because they might say, well, that's the one. I might not you... agree with my choice. Exactly. No, I that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you have, all right, you're thinking about what happens to your archive, but there are a number of those portraits in the portrait gallery already. Yes. There are a number of your landscapes in the National Museum of Wales already, so some national museums have your work. Um, the moment, I think, for me, this photographic exhibition looks terrific. I think it really works very, very well, fills the space of this lovely gallery very, very well. Congratulations and thanks.